Ahoy, you salty sailors. Time to raise anchor and set sail for your best scrawny life. Arr! The weather is turning dry in Iowa, and we are, we are starting to head into a drought. Uh, the water level is quite low in this river. Many of the fish uh, are migrating out of the river. And those that remain are concentrated in the pools. There was an eagle in a dead tree directly above this pool when I arrived there. So the fish were knew they were being hunted. The fish were very skittish. There were a couple large carp at the head of the pool, but they were, there was a uh, little bed of, of uh, pond weed, and they were st sticking within that, that bed of pond weed to camouflage themselves. And they just simply would not come out of it. I cast to it several times, but I got snagged each time. Finally, I, I went upstream and made a downstream, a risky downstream presentation, but I did manage to get this little one. The fish that tend to migrate out of the river are things like smallmouth and walleye. The, the, the juvenile fish of all the species will remain in the river, but the, the large adults are t generally moving downstream and migrating out of the river. The fish that remain behind are suckers, um, carp, catfish, freshwater drum, things like that. But the carp were not working the, the runs in Boulder Gardens. They were concentrated in the pools. So here's a little small mouth that was still in the river. It was quite hazy. We had some of that Canadian wildfire smoke and it made seeing the, the drum and carp difficult uh, because that's a sight fishing type of proposition. So I decided to target catfish. Uh, I started out with a crayfish pattern, but I switched over to that larger sucker pattern. It seemed to just get more bites. So in conditions like this, I've caught catfish in pools with anything from a stonefly nymph to, to what you see here, a large sucker pattern. Ordinarily, of course, channel catfish will browse the bottom, uh, meaning they will have their head down, uh, put their tail up a little bit, spread out their whiskers, or shall we say whisker array, over the bottom and detect any crayfish or small minnows or leeches or whatnot that are that are within range of their whiskers. And of course, if they detect a scent, a trail of scent in the current, they will follow that to the source of and feed on whatever that might be. But in this case, where the water level is so low that they are afraid to move from pool to pool uh, for fear of being preyed on by eagles and so forth, they will quickly browse the pool and, and clean the, the, the whole bottom of any potential food source. And so then their behavior changes and they begin to act more like ambush predators where they're waiting for something to come into the pool from upstream. So if you're thinking that, well, this really doesn't seem like channel catfish behavior to me, it's, it's all being driven by how low the river level is in this case. And they will put up a good fight, as, at least as good of a fight as a smallmouth bass. 
that broad, uh, that wide shovel head of theirs. Of course, it's a different type of fight, but but uh, it it bends the rod all the same. There's about an average size one for this particular river. The thing about them is, once hooked, they, they, they it, it, it's hard to remove the hook sometimes. Here you can see just how low the river is. Probably not going to make it through this without scraping some rocks. It hit the first tongue pretty good there. There's another one. Ooh, oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> that's, that's why there aren't... Normally, there's a lot of float tubers on this river, but this in this case, it's just so low that you'd be dragging the boat more than riding in it. So there you can see how hazy it's like. It's like, wow, Canada, put the fire out. We don't need your second-hand smoke. Now, I'm sure all of my Iowa viewers know this, but for anyone out of state who may not, who may not know this, channel catfish have three sharp spines, one in their each of their uh, pectoral fins and one in their dorsal fin, and they're serrated and, and very sharp. And, and, a, and a lot of the catfishes we have here also have those spines. So pay attention to the way that I hold these fish. Uh, you'll notice I'm just looping my fingers around the spines uh, so that as I'm handling them, I'm not getting cut or poked. There was once on the Des Moines River a group of float tubers that came down, and there was a boy there who had stepped on a stone cat and impaled it, the whole catfish was was impaled onto his uh, f the bottom of his foot, its dorsal spine. They had to pull that out with a pair of pliers, which I'm sure uh, got a nice big infection later on. So yeah, you want to just slip your hand so that uh, the that webbing between your index finger and thumb is right behind the dorsal fin and then take the other fingers and just wrap it around the pectoral fins so that you don't get spined. Jumping back to the subject of why their behavior is the way it is when the river is low, you also have to consider that we're in the hottest part of the summer now, and at the same time the river level is dropping, so a smaller volume of water and a larger amount of solar energy per unit of volume. Now, fish, catfish, and all fish, of course, are cold-blooded. So the temperature of the water controls their metabolism. So as the water temperature in the river begins to climb, their activity level also begins to climb as well. So you have concentrated fish in a smaller and smaller pool, and they're all really, really hungry. So that's why you can catch them on flies at this time, even a really large fly, um, whereas other times of the year, that's just not, uh, that would not be considered typical of their behavior. Alright, let's take a look at the fruiting body of an ectomycorrhizal fungus. This one, the common name is Old Man of the Woods, Strobolomyces strobolaceus. You can see here it does have a partial veil when it is immature, as we saw in the previous video. It is a bolete, it has that bolete pore surface on the underside. 
there's a red staining that occurs in the context of the cap when the mushroom is sliced open. This is at 200% speed, so it actually takes twice this long to develop. You can see sort of a brick red. Here's uh, another look at it. Uh, see the pore layer. Now there's quite a bit of variation in the appearance of these mushrooms. This one is very dark and shaggy like this. This one's more light and blotchy. Here's one that's somewhere between the two. There's another look at the pore surface. The spore print of this mushroom is black or dark brown. And here you can see the those uh, jagged, ragged edges left behind by the partial veil. This is an edible mushroom. I've never tried it. It doesn't really look appealing to me. Now here's a mushroom that could be confused with chanterelles. This is Omphalotus illudens, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. This is a poisonous mushroom, uh, and it will cause severe gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, severe cramping. Now you'll notice that it has the true paper-thin blade-like gills on the other side. It has a nice smell. It smells like it would be edible. Jack-o'-lantern mushrooms are saprotrophic, so they really only appear around dead trees. But the best way to differentiate them from chanterelles is their true paper-thin gills. And here we see some true chanterelles, and you'll notice that the it does not have the true paper-thin gills, it has the false gills, those blunt folds or ridges in the underside of the cap, the hymenium. Now, and here's, of course, another orange mushroom, uh, is the lobster mushroom, but it has generally no gills at all. All right, let's take a little break and draw something. Let's draw Jeremy Wade from River Monsters. No particular reason, just, just uh, sketched out a little thing that uh, that I kind of like was doodling along here. So on top of that doodle, we're gonna do sort of the modified Loomis method. We'll get a circle. We'll divide that circle laterally and vertically. Um, Need a little more forehead space, on, uh, I think, here. Uh, he has kind of a tall forehead. Put some, a uh, little bit uh, receding hairline there. Uh, had to work on that nose a little bit. It is, uh, the, the digital drawing is a little bit more sculptural. It, if I were to draw this in conventional media, I would do lots of sketches and studies on just a scrap piece of paper first, and then I would go to my, my actual final substrate. And once I had fully learned how to draw each each part of the figure, then I would go to my final substrate and, and put it down. But in this case, uh, with the digital painting, it's a lot more uh, sculptural. Uh, you can just add things and pull and push and tweak and liquefy and do all sorts of things. So takes on more of a sculptural aspect. So there we have uh, kind of deepening. He ha kind of has deep set eyes. Uh, so we'll uh, kind of darken those up a little bit and uh, a little bit more of the uh, lines around the mouth to uh, indicate some age there. I think that that's pretty close to his look. I just drew that freehand, not from a reference. And we'll start to uh, start to add some some details to the figure. There was one episode where he uh, stayed in camp so long that his clothes were just like all shredded and torn up. So that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the look I'm going for here.
so there we have it um, maybe we'll uh, come back to this in the next episode and finish it up